So today, we're finishing up the $30 workbench. And for weeks now, I've been promising you that this inexpensive construction lumber bench was going to be able to handle all of your possible work holding needs without a traditional cast iron face vise. Even though every project I've ever done personally has involved a traditional bench and a vise, I'm still going to teach you how to get everything done without one. To make our modifications to the $30 bench, we're just going to use the same tools we've been using in the Woodwork for Human series. Except, we're also going to need a couple of chisels. And you might want some chisel buying advice. So here it is. Go buy some chisels. Seriously, that's it. Personally, I really like these Narex chisels with the wood handles and these Irwin Marples chisels with the blue plastic handles. They're both really solid chisel sets that can be purchased affordably from Amazon, and I will link to them in the description. But honestly, I just don't think it makes that much difference. People even say Harbor Freight chisels are pretty good. So go down to your local hardware store or home center, buy an inexpensive set of even carpenter grade chisels, and you'll probably be pretty happy with them. If you end up not liking them, you can always upgrade later. As for me, I'm a little bit of a tool hoarder, so this morning I just kind of reached into the oddball drawer and found three decent quality old beater chisels, and these are going to be the chisels that I use from now on in this series. In order for this bench to be a really good work surface, it's going to have to hold work pieces in all sorts of orientations so that we can work on the faces, the edges, and the ends of boards and have them stay stable. The bench is also going to have to provide a stable surface for sawing, it's going to have to allow us to hold boards down to mortise them, chisel and rasp details, and hold small parts. And that is a tall order. That's a lot of stuff. But they say, if you've got a really big project, you always want to do the simplest thing first. So how's this for simple? Now that we've cut this notch on the underside of the bench, we've actually created a vise. Seriously. Here's how it works. Let's say I wanted to work on the end of this board, maybe cut in a tenon or another piece of joinery. All I need to do to use it in this notch is to take a piece of 2x4, like an offcut from this bench, and plane in a shallow angle along one edge. Two or three degrees is great. Now I've got a wedge. I can put my work piece and the wedge together in the notch and then pound the wedge in with my mallet. It holds really strongly and it's easy for me to saw or chisel on the end of this board. Now, that's all well and good for small stock, like this. But what if I have to work on a larger board, like this one? For instance, the edge of this board is extremely ragged. Somebody was practicing with his new hardpoint disposable saw and didn't do a very good job. How are we going to plane this edge to clean it up? Well, we can still hold this in this notch, even though the board is so much wider than the notch itself is. This board is a lot thinner than the one I was just working on, so I'll add a little spacer to my wedge and then pound them both in with the mallet. Now this piece is held just as securely as the smaller piece is, and I can plane along the top edge. Now I'm going to plane from the outside of the bench towards the inside, because that's going to help it to butt up against the inside of this notch and not get knocked out. I also might put my leg up on the bench to add a little bit of extra weight. But with these couple of adjustments, I can plane the end of this board with complete confidence, and it stays in just as tightly as it would on a traditional cast iron vise. Now that I can work effectively on the ends of boards, I also want to work on the faces. And for that, I'm going to use a simple system of holes and pegs in the end of my bench. I'll start by using my disposable saw as a square to draw a perpendicular line a couple inches from the end of the bench. Then I'm going to drill three three-quarter inch holes about four inches apart from one another. I'm going to keep the holes in the middle of 2x4s so that they're not splitting a glue joint. You might have to shift them around a little bit to accommodate whatever lumber you use on your bench. It's pretty important that these holes be plumb and straight up and down, and that can be a little bit tricky with a bit brace. On some other projects, I've used a square next to the auger bit to make sure that it stays straight up and down. But in the Woodworking for Humans series, we haven't built or bought a square yet. But luckily, your Stanley 404 is actually pretty square, and you can use it to keep your bit up and down. Just go ahead and get your auger started, and then move the 404 in on its side. You can tell visually whether the bit is up or down, and if the bottom of your sole is nice and shiny like mine is, you can use the reflection of the bit to further refine it and make sure it's really perfectly plump. Using this technique, I drilled three holes across the end of my bench, and they all came out nicely. 
To make the pegs, I just got a piece of hardwood dowel down at the home center. This is four feet long and it cost me less than three dollars. I'm going to stick this into one of the holes that I just drilled and push it down below the bottom edge of the bench until it sticks out about an inch. I'm just using a piece of scrap here and going by touch to make sure I've got the right projection. Once I've got enough dowel sticking out, I'll flush cut the top, knock it up from underneath, saw it down from the top, and in from the bottom. And that's going to give me a nice notch. I'll repeat that with my other two pegs. Now I've got a flexible board holding system that will let me work on a board the long way and keep it nicely restrained. And if I want to work across a board, like if I'm scrub planing rough stock, it's easy to just flip it 90 degrees and push it back up against the stops again. With these three pegs, it's really simple to work on the faces of boards in either direction. And when I don't want them anymore, I can just take my mallet, knock them down below the surface, and they won't stick up and get in the way of other operations. So now, I can plane the faces of boards in either direction and get a good result. So there's only one more surface I need to worry about. I need to be able to work on board edges. Now, when I'm working on a narrow board, I can just use a simple planing stop, and the board will stay in place nicely with just the weight of the plane or the other tools on top of it. But if I'm working on a wide board like this, a planing stop is not going to get the job done. Anytime you're working on one edge of a board, the board is going to be balanced on the other edge, and it's just going to be much too wobbly to get a good result. We're going to need a good work holding device specifically for putting wide boards up on edge. So to work on the edges of wide boards, we're going to build the palm. This is an ancient work holding device. It probably originated in China, and it's been modified to have this post on it that fits into the square mortise on our bench. Now the palm, and most of the rest of the stuff I'm talking about in this video, came from this book, Ingenious Mechanics by Chris Schwartz. And it is an excellent book, chock full of ideas about low Roman benches and work holding. Way more stuff than I could ever cover in YouTube videos. And it's also just a fun and fascinating read. I have no affiliation with Chris or his publisher, and I get nothing if you buy the book, but I still think you should buy it because it's fantastic and it's full of great stuff that you can use. In his book, Chris recommends making the palm out of half-inch hardwood. But you might not have any half-inch hardwood laying around, so I just used some half-inch plywood, cheap stuff from the home center, and it's working fine so far. Your palm needs to be about 8 inches across the narrow side, and on the long side it needs to be, I don't know, longer than 8 inches. 10 inches, it really doesn't make a huge difference. You're just going to want to cut a notch in the middle of one of the narrow sides. And it's a pretty narrow angle, less than 45 degrees, and I left about 2 inches of meat on either side so I can butt boards up against this and it's not going to be fragile. Once you've made the top part of the palm, you're also going to want to make the post. This is just a chunk of offcut. I ripped it to rough size and then slowly planed it down until it was a snug friction fit in my mortise. I'm going to want to adjust the height of my palm with mallet taps so it needs to fit in semi-tightly, definitely not loosely. So sneak up on that fit really slowly until you've got exactly what you're looking for. Chris recommends attaching the top to the post using a shallow mortise and some Roman nails. But wouldn't you know it, I am fresh out of Roman nails. I must have used them up on my last project, I guess. So instead of doing that, I recommend you go back from your notch about an inch and a half and drill a three-quarter inch hole. Then find the center of your post and lay out a three-quarter inch circle. And now, we're just going to make the same round tenon that we've used for all of our Woodworking for Humans projects so far. So once you've got it laid out, chop it, trim it, glue it, wedge it, and flush cut. And then you can add a screw on either corner of the post, which will prevent twisting and just reinforce it a little bit more. Now you have a mobile planing stop that can hold narrow boards on edge even when they're very wide. You can tap it up and down to accommodate whatever size you need and it'll handle narrow boards and wide ones. So I really like the Palm as a work holding device, but it does have some limitations. For one thing, it works best on boards that are sort of within the span of your arms. If the board edge is longer than you can reach, it's going to be difficult to plane it effectively. The Palm also isn't great if you're doing something very wide, like maybe a glued up panel. You'd be planing like way up here, and that's completely impractical. So for doing longer and wider pieces, what I really want is something that will hold the board sort of along the side of the bench so I can kneel on it and then get a nice full planing stroke all the way along a long surface. And luckily, the exact fixture I need has existed for hundreds of years. It's called a crochet. It's French. Or if you don't like the French pronunciation, you could call it a crotchet. But, ew. 
The crochet is a really simple, shallow wooden hook that's attached to the side of the bench, and its holding capabilities are amazing. I made mine out of three pieces of hardwood. I glued them together and then got ready to do the layout, which is the most important part of making a good crochet. The wide end of your crochet needs to accommodate the biggest stock you have, so I suggest leaving two inches or more over at this end. The middle of the crochet is a very long, gradual taper, which allows boards of different thicknesses to be held really firmly. Then right at the end, there's a very shallow curve, and that allows even thin stock to be gripped effectively down here in the corner. To lay out this curve right here, you can use any medium-sized round object that's laying around your workspace. I used the base of my router, it is 7 inches across if you're curious. I used that to draw in the curve, and then I connected the top of the curve to the back of the crochet, just using a stick as a straight edge. Remember to leave a few inches on this end here, so you have a big, stable mounting surface to connect the crochet to the bench. The outside edge doesn't really do anything, but it needs to look nice, and you don't want any sharp corners or angles that you're going to hurt yourself on when you're walking around the bench. So use the same curve to lay out this part on the outside, and then just connect it to the outside point using your straight edge. Cutting your crochet out of a big block of hardwood is not easy, but there are a lot of techniques you can use to make it simpler. Start by wedging your block into your bench, and then cut off that outside line using your hard point saw. I will admit, this part did not go quickly for me, and by the end, I was really wishing for my bandsaw. But I did it, you can do it too. Plane off the rough saw marks that you've left, and then secure the block to the bench using a planing stop and a clamp. Now we're going to make that outside curve using a chisel and a mallet. You can use the chisel in the bevel up position and take big bites at the beginning while you're just wasting away a lot of stock. Then, as you get closer to the line, you're going to want to make one precise cut on either side of the board, following that layout line very carefully. When you have two lines to the correct depth on either end, then all the waste sticking up in the middle is easy to take off, and you're not going to go below your layout lines because you have those nice guides on either edge. Once you've got the shape roughed out, you can clean it up using your wide chisel and then your sanding block to get a smooth finish. Doing the inside of the crochet is basically the same thing. Saw the long line and then chisel out the curve. Except this time, you're going to flip the chisel over and use it bevel down. The bevel down position really excels at doing inside curves, because you can ride the bevel and very slightly adjust the angle of the chisel as you're tapping it to get a nice smooth curve. You're getting rid of a lot of waste here, so you can use it as a great opportunity to practice chiseling curves. Just ride that bevel in, making the curve over and over again as you approach your layout line. And by the time you get down to it, you'll be very good at chiseling curves. You can attach the crochet to the side of your bench using a couple of long lag screws and washers. Or if you don't have that hardware and you don't have a socket wrench, you could just attach it using pegs cut from our dowel stock. And just glue those in with regular woodworking glue, they'll work great too. No matter how you install the crochet, all the drilling and countersinking that you need to do can be done with the brace and bit. And once you're done, you get to see just how well the crochet holds a board. I mean, look at that. Seriously, look at this. I am never going to get tired of doing this. It's like magic. With the board in the crochet, you can hold it with your knee, and that works very, very well for short-ish boards. But for longer boards, we're going to need something to hold up that far end a little bit. Something like this, for instance. Grab an offcut from the bench, and drill staggered three-quarter inch holes about one inch apart. When your holes are drilled, you can screw a wedge to one side, and then it's easy to pound it into the notch in your bench, and add a peg to whatever hole is convenient. Once you have this setup complete, you can hold boards of pretty much any length and any width very easily in your bench. Fixtures like this, that are usually called a dead man or a board jack, have existed for a really long time. But I'm going to take just a tiny bit of credit for myself. I figured out all the ways to make it work with this bench. So this one thing, this one's mine. Oh, and you might be thinking, hmm, I really want to make one of those, but I don't have a bunch of one-inch hardwood sitting around. What can I make it out of? Well, I think you can make it out of plywood. In fact, I'm totally sure you can make it out of plywood. Because I did it. 
This is just three pieces of three quarter inch plywood that I glued together and then cut out. I blew this one out on my bandsaw because I just didn't have time to make two of these things by hand. But I know you can work plywood really effectively with hand tools because I've done it a bunch of times. Obviously, the better quality plywood you use, the better result you're gonna get, but you can pretty much use whatever's sitting around. If all you have to make this thing is plywood, don't hesitate, it'll work great. So listen, I am the first one to admit that the $30 bench looks a little peculiar, or weird. Okay, it's, it's weird looking, it is. But it also works. Now, I've been using a traditional bench and a metal screw-operated vise for over a decade, and I love them. But one thing I've noticed about regular vices is that they work so well, they make you a little bit lazy. No matter what you're doing, you can just clamp it in the vise, tighten it down, and go. And you never really have to think very much about work holding. When you get rid of that vise and move on to a more basic bench, like the one we've just finished, you get to do all of the exact same stuff. Planing, sawing, chiseling, sanding, faces, edges, ends. It's all possible on this bench. It's all effective, but it does require a little bit more thinking. And you know, that's probably not a bad thing. As craftspeople, we probably should spend a little bit more time thinking about our work as we're doing it. The other thing I love about this bench is that it doesn't have any fancy components and it's so cheap to build. Once you've made one, you can make one again, no problem. If you move houses and you have to leave your old bench behind, or if your bench just gets old and worn out, you can always just grab a stack of 2x4s, a little bit of glue, a few basic tools, and bang out another one in a day or two. It's just not a very big project, and then you can use it to make all kinds of things. It's really exciting. Now, if you're watching this video and you're enjoying it, it will probably make a lot more sense to you if you watch the rest of the videos in the Woodwork for Humans series. And there is a link to that playlist down in the description. Go watch all of those videos and you'll understand what tools we're using and why, and more of the techniques that maybe I kind of glossed over a little bit in this video. Now, you're gonna be watching this video on a Wednesday, and on the day after this video airs, I will be at Spring Make at Lincoln Electric in Cleveland, Ohio, which is also where I live. So if you are also gonna be at Spring Make, by all means, come over and say hi. I would love to meet you. Unless I'm talking to somebody really important, like Jimmy DiResto or Alex Steele. If I'm talking to someone like that, leave me alone. I'm just kidding. Come over and say hi no matter what. I love meeting my viewers. And before I go, I have to thank my patrons on Patreon. These videos literally would not be possible without their support. So if you're interested in supporting this content, go over to patreon.com slash Rex Kruger and check out all the stuff I have for my patrons. My patrons get all of these videos three or four days early. They get exclusive blog posts, tool reviews, book reviews, tool giveaways, and a bunch of other stuff. For instance, I just did a bonus video with Tim Cunningham, the Urban Forge, about how to pick affordable hammers for the beginning blacksmith. And that video is just for my patrons. So maybe you want to see it. It's not very difficult. Anyway. Thanks to everybody who watched this video. The $30 bench has been an amazing experience, and I can't wait to use it to make more awesome stuff using super minimum tools. Thanks a lot, and I'll see you next week.